your weight loss diet healthy? That's what we are discussing today. Hi, if you're new to my channel, I am Sophie and you are very welcome. Sitting here perching on my kitchen table today, chatting about a healthy weight loss diet. Is your weight loss diet or the one that you're thinking of doing, is it healthy? Seven vital questions to ask before you embark on any diet. This is really, really important. But again, if you're new to my channel, you know I am here every single week, almost every single week, uh, from my home here in Los Angeles, giving you tips, tools, information, and inspiration on living your absolute best life, covering every single area of your life, from nutrition to mindset to exercise and the whole nine yards, everything that we need to do to keep us healthy and being our best selves for years to come. So do make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. All right, let's get straight into it. So I hear, obviously, we all do so much information about all these crazy diets and a new one comes on the on the list in sort of diet season there's two diet seasons in the year one is the new year and then we get the kind of pre-summer kind of bikini body situation and uh, we'll see all these new diets crop up and then we see the uh, books on the on the bestseller lists and whatnot it's really interesting to me because I've done so much research about this that many of the diet in fact I would say almost all of the diets that have been on that bestseller list sort of historically for a long, long time are diets that have now proven to be completely ineffective, if not downright dangerous and very, very misleading. So starting with the Dukan diet and the South Beach diet, and then there was the Eat Right Be Your Type diet. and. It goes on and on. There's always a spin, isn't there? So I come up from a point of view, being a nutritionist, a board certified nutritionist, I have a very pragmatic uh, approach to, uh, to diets. And uh, for me, it has to be uh, based in, in evidence, uh, rooted in evidence-based science, because we can all have an opinion, right? There's many opinions on the internet, and even doctors, by the way, who have a very small amount of nutritional training, I think it's a total of eight to 10 hours in eight years, and will come up with books. But as far as, you know, the nutrition is concerned, it can be a little bit sus, as, as my daughter says. All right, so let's get straight into it now. Question number one. Does this diet, the diet that you've heard of or I'm thinking of doing, does this diet protect me from the number one killer disease in the Western world, which is heart disease? It's really, really simple. And that's how I kind of, you know, reverse engineer it. Let's think of the diseases that we really want to avoid or the diseases that we absolutely dread because there is no point being skinny or doing some rapid weight loss thing if you're going to end up, in, you don't want a skinny casket, right? It's not about getting a skinny casket. And to me, it's really, really foolhardy to embark on a diet that doesn't address disease prevention because... Uh, I've been in this business long enough to see so many women coming to me who have done many of those diets over the years uh, and who have wound up in a very, very, very bad shape and the kind of shape that you would dread and not want to be in yourself. So does said diet protect against heart disease? And what that's basically going to mean is that you need to look at the foods that are being recommended for you to eat and ask yourself if those particular foods um, actually have been proven scientifically to protect against heart disease. And the glaring um, issue that I see right now, particularly in this culture with some of the highest trending diets, are that they really, really don't. So if there is a diet that is uh, recommending that you up your fat content, and particularly your saturated fat content from meat and dairy, well, there's a big that should be a huge, huge red 
flag to you. You know, the uh, advisory from the um, uh, presidential advisory from the American Heart Association has now categorically, because they were so sick and tired of all the nonsense out there and the confusing information, have categorically now said that saturated fat puts you at higher risk for heart disease and it should be significantly reduced. So, simple as that. Does said diet protect me or even lower my risk? At the very worst, I hope it doesn't increase my risk of the number one killer in the Western world and this is particularly true for women. All right, vital question number two. Does said diet lower my risk of three cancers. And these are three ubiquitous cancers, the ones that I personally hear the most about, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. So those are the three that can be preventable. You can lower your risk via diet. Isn't that hopeful and exciting? You really can. You can significantly reduce your risk of uh, getting either of those three cancers, and if you have had them and you're a survivor, you can significantly decrease your risk of reoccurrence. Okay, so that's what you need to ask yourself when you're looking at this diet and you're looking at the foods that they are suggesting that you eat. It's really not going to be that difficult to sort of do a quick Google search. And I will put some, some um, studies underneath this video to make it easier for you so you don't necessarily have to do a Google search. But if you are interested and if you're really worried and you think, wait a minute, I'm thinking of doing this diet, but wait, does this food group and that food group and they're asking me to up you know whatever it is these macronutrients and and, and whatnot is that going to lead to cancer protection or is it going to increase my risk of getting breast cancer prostate cancer and colon cancer so you get to ask that question and you need to have that question answered before you would touch that diet with a barge pole. Really important. Vital question number three. Does said diet help my body to detox? Now, before I get into the kind of air quote detox um, conversation, it's a tricky conversation because marketing has made detox a bit of a dirty word because everything's a detox, isn't it? Oh, drink charcoal lemonade and you're detoxing or do this master powder liver cleanse and you're detoxing or whatever it might be. So we've sort of got a little bit sick and tired, uh, I have anyway, of the word uh, detoxing as, as applied to sort of food and mainly products. But here's the thing. You don't need all these crazy products. You don't need the charcoal and the cleansing powders and all of this business because you've already got your natural organs of detoxification inbuilt. You are retrofitted with them at birth. Our body is a natural, miraculous machine that constantly detoxes. But as we get older, those organs of det detoxification can kind of slow down. They crank down a little bit. They can become impaired. They can get kind of, uh, you know, a little bit bunged up. So our job is to make sure that everything runs really smoothly for as long as we can have it running smoothly. I mean, who doesn't want the detoxification fire of an 18-year-old? Uh, you know, that's why 18-year-olds can get away with eating a lot more crap and junk because all of their organs of detoxification, uh, for the most part, are really firing on all 10 cylinders, whereas when we get past 40 and certainly past 50, things start breaking down a little bit. Now, our main organs of detoxification detoxification would be our liver and our, uh, our digestive system. There's also obviously our skin, where we sweat, our lymph nodes, etc. But we really want to focus mainly on our liver and our gut. So does said diet contain foods that will help your body to detox? Do these foods help your liver? Do they support your liver in detoxification? Do they support your gut 
in detoxing what doesn't need to be there. Now, what doesn't need to be there is very, very important, particularly for women and particularly as we get older, particularly after menopause, because there's free-floating estrogen in your system. We don't want to become estrogen dominant. That can lead to put us at higher risk uh, for breast cancer. So we need to get rid of this excess estrogen. How do we do that? through our gut. How does the gut get rid of it? Well, we need a lot of fiber. We need a lot of cellulose, plant-based fiber. It's like a rotor rooter. It's like a broom. It will carry all of that out where it does not belong. So the main thing that you want to look for, if you're going, well, wait a minute, what does she mean by detoxification? Well, make sure that whatever diet is, whatever the foods are on that diet, that there is a ton of plant fiber because that's how you're going to detox. Also, uh, you want to look for certain fruits and vegetables that nature luckily ha has, uh, it, it's our medicine, isn't it? Nature contains uh, our, our, the medicine that we need to stay healthy. And in the case of liver detoxification, uh, foods like <clears throat> beautiful root vegetables like beets, or beetroot if you're in England, you know, that will help to support your liver and detox your liver. It thins your bile. You need to have your bile nice and thin to keep it all flowing and to keep the liver doing what it needs to do. Beets are magical. Also for detoxification and liver, cruciferous veggies. So tons of them of your uh, broccoli and your bok choy and your watercress and, and whatnot. And there are also certain fruits that are absolutely wonderful for detoxification. So any diet that is telling you to to cut back on fruits and veggies and root veggies and things like that. Big red flag. Okay, question number four, vital question number four is, does said diet lead to good gut health? And this plays a little bit on the previous question, but our gut health is our, the foundation of our health. Without good gut health, you can not be healthy. And if you have poor gut health is going to lead to weight gain and it's going to lead to obesity eventually. It just is the case now there's so many fascinating studies that are, have made that connection between obesity and poor gut health. So what is good gut health? Good gut health is when your good and bad bacteria in your gut is balanced. There is a balance, a healthy balance. There's always going to be a bit of good and a bit of bad, but we want more good than bad. So do, how do we keep the good bacteria in there and, and so that they can the good guys can crowd out the bad guys. Well, we have to feed them. Sorry, that's my dishwasher going off. We have to feed them. And um, what do we feed them with? What do they need to eat? What are they hungry for? Well, they're hungry for plant fiber. And that's why uh, diets that cut out all this fiber and all the kind of quote unquote grain free diets and everything are a little bit sorry, dishwasher, are a little bit scary because you're cutting out something that could be so unbelievably beneficial towards your gut. So we need to feed our gut, we need to give it uh, the good bacteria, all this wonderful food so that they can multiply and crowd out the uh, bad guys. And uh, so please, oh my gosh, if that goes off one more time. Um, so please pay great attention to that. There's a lot of misinformation about there about gut health. Oh, you've got to drink bone broth, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. Really not necessarily, well, not the case at all, actually, because of the contaminants. Um, but uh, you can, you can uh, create really good gut health uh, by way of a beautiful diet. And I'm all for this because, as I said, you know, if you want to create that foundation, then that needs to be 100% in place. Okay, that leads me to key question that you need to ask number five. Do the foods on said diet minimize my exposure or increase my exposure to contaminants and pollutants in the environment. Now, this is something that is very often overlooked, and it's a question that I want you to ask, and it's a question I want you to start asking more of, because unfortunately, as time goes on, since I wrote my first book, Gorgeously Green, back in 2008, where I really went into the environmental crisis that we're now in, um, it's got worse. It's not got better. It's got worse. So now, unfortunately, to cut this this point really to make it as quick as I can um, our waterways 
and our um, beautiful rolling green pastures aren't as clean as they should be and they were a hundred years ago. It is inescapable now that industrial pollution affects everything, so much so that our waterways, our oceans, our rivers and streams and lakes have become for the most part like sewers, and I am not exaggerating here, and no matter what um, where our animals graze or whatever they eat, they're still getting dioxins, which are carcinogens uh, from industrial pollution. So you may say, oh shoot, well that's a pretty dire situation, Sophie. It kind of is, but you can minimize the exposure by eating as low down on the food chain as you possibly can. And the reason for this is that these um, contaminants like dioxins, PCBs, which are fire retardants, microplastics, etc., um, they make their way up the food chain and certainly dioxins and PCBs are lipophilic. It means they store themselves in fatty tissue. So the bigger the anim animal or the mammal, and that's why as, as we have this fatty tissue, we all carry what's a quote unquote a body burden. Everybody does, even a baby is born with one now. Um, so we really want to eat as low on the food scale as we possibly can. And to, in a perfect world, to really, really dramatically minimize your exposure to these contaminants and pollutants, you are going to be eating vegetables. And of course you may go, wait a minute, don't vegetables have pesticides on them? Well, yeah, they do, but you can go look at the Dirty Dozen list. I'll put a link for that underneath by the Environmental Working Group. There's a new one that's put out every single year, and it'll show you the top 12 vegetables uh, fruits or vegetables that need to be organic. So done and done. You can avoid those, make sure those are organic and the rest of them you should be okay. And also you obviously wash your fruits and veggies really well. So we do need to think about this, particularly as we get older, that our diet minimizes our exposure as much as we possibly can. All right, I think we're on six now. So number six vital question to ask, and this is one you're really going to want to be very, very clear about. Does said diet lead to long-term or permanent weight loss? And this is where, this is a question that I ask so many of my clients that come to me because they're like, oh, because everybody wants rapid weight loss, right? It's so attractive, this rapid weight loss. Oh, I just want to quickly lose this weight so I can, for the wedding or the reunion or the bikini season or whatever it is. But don't be fooled by that. So many of these diets give you false hope. And it is an absolute travesty because a lot of these rapid weight loss diets will uh, give you a scale weight. It's not water. It's not dealing with visceral fat, which by the way is your belly fat, which most of us want to get rid of. So it's that number on the scale and it'll fool you into thinking that A, you have lost all this inner fat, which you haven't because uh, it's subcutaneous fat. But it gives you false hope because that rapid weight loss, you'll put all that weight back on. It's just a matter of uh, time. It's not if, it's when, and often it's very quickly. And in the years that I've been working with clients, it's so deleterious to their health, too much to go into now to yo-yo diet. Don't do it because it really harms your health. It harms your metabolism. And more than anything, it actually harms your, your self-esteem because what they cleverly do, these diets, is like, oh, you get this rapid weight loss and then the weight comes back on. It always comes back on and some, normally about 15 pounds more than you even lost, right? It will come back on. And they know that then you'll turn and blame yourself oh, it was, it was my fault, I stopped doing it, or it wasn't, you know, I, I've got to just do it again. I got that weight loss and I'm going to do it again and I'm just going to try harder this time. But unfortunately, the problem is in the diet and not in you. So be very, very careful about that. And what you want to look at is you want to look at long-term studies. What is the diet that, that lasts and is sustainable and people are still doing and still maintaining their weight loss a year later, two years later, three years later and beyond? And I'm going to put a study in the description underneath this video of one such study, one of the few studies that's been done and has tracked people with control groups and everything else. And you see the diet that lasts, weight loss diet that lasts be three years and beyond. All right, and then finally, this leads me to vital question number seven to ask. And number seven is this. So 
it does said diet speak to mindset and lifestyle? And this is uh, um, almost the most important thing that I feel so passionate about as a health coach because so many of these diets, well, almost all diets, just by virtue of it being a quote unquote diet or weight loss diet, is just food in, food out, foods to eat, foods to avoid. It's just food centric. It's just obsessing and focusing on what you can eat and what you can't eat. But that is one small part of the puzzle. Trust me, it's one very small part of the puzzle. Yes, it's important. Yes, you have to get it down. Yes, you have to know exactly what you can eat and what you can't eat for long-term effective weight loss. There's a long-term effective weight loss strategy. You have to know that. But it's also exercise and it is mindset. If this particular program or diet doesn't have a massive mindset component to it, there is something wrong because we are human beings. We are wired a certain way. And unfortunately, we are wired to crave these tastes of sweet, fatty, salty. And we live in a society now where there is nothing but sweet, fatty, salty. So you need a tremendous amount of mindset support in order to be able to not only understand this, but have a strategy on how to overcome it. Because otherwise, if you don't, it will eventually fail. Again, it's not if, it is when. So these are the seven vital questions to ask yourself before you embark on any weight loss diet so that you don't waste your time and your money. Life's too short. Take care of yourself, take care of your health and make really smart choices that are ultimately going to lead you to feeling really good about yourself, not a failure who's just, oh, I haven't got the motivation, I haven't got the willpower. I have. It's not you. It's that you haven't been given an effective strategy. And finally, if you feel a little bit sort of lost in the words, you're confused, you're overwhelmed, you've heard this and you're like, but I still don't know what, what the best way is for me and I don't really know what to do and I need clarity. Well, then you can jump on a breakthrough call. You may be able to, I should say, jump on a breakthrough call with me. So I've opened up my calendar for the next 48 hours. Uh, depending on when this video goes live, I'll make sure that I've opened up my calendar for a few spots where you can jump on a breakthrough call with me to get clarity and we can work through maybe finding um, a strategy for you that might really work. And um, these spots, as I've said, are so limited because there's only one of me, I need five of me. And so if that's something that you think you might want to do, click the link underneath this video. I'll put it right underneath this video so it's the first thing you can see. And if by any chance you don't manage to get a slot within the next 48 hours, you might be pushed a couple of weeks out to find a slot. Now, the one thing I ask is if you book a slot with me for a couple of weeks out, for two or three weeks out, please be respectful and keep that date because I have a big long waiting list otherwise and if you don't show up for your call then somebody else misses out so that's that's just my my only thing that I want to say so that's it from me and um, let's do it let's do it ladies and gents you know honestly if you've if you're struggling if you're if you've got unwanted pounds if you've got energy uh, that's flagging and you feel sluggish and there's so many different pieces of the puzzle that need to be addressed and sorted out but the good news is that it is 100% possible don't let anybody tell you you can't look gorgeous and beautiful and slim and strong and be your best uh, most confident self oozing with self-confidence, even after a certain age, that age when many, particularly women, I think go, oh gosh, well, I guess now, you know, it's all over and I, you know, I'm just better just accept that I'm just going to get this growing midsection and, you know, it's not, you know, it's all downhill from now on in. It doesn't have to be. I am here to champion you, to help you, to coach you, to inspire you. It doesn't have to be. And if you enjoyed this video and you want more videos along these kind of same lines of inspiring you and helping you to make healthier choices, check out some of my other videos. And I will see you next time.